So I want to talk a little bit more about what God is doing in our midst and talk about the fact that the work of God is actually sometimes seen in the most unusual and unexpected of places. And one of those things I mentioned yesterday is that God answered our prayers and praying for the Muslim world and praying for the possibility to share the gospel with those who uh, are of a different faith. And God brought them right to our doorsteps and that God has really uh, given us the opportunity to, we, don't, we no longer have to go to Syria or to Iraq to share the gospel uh, because they're coming to our neighborhoods and they are our neighbors and our churches could now reach out to those communities. Uh, I want to talk about immigration and the way that immigration has actually blessed this nation rather than what the narrative out there is that it has hindered this nation. Can we put the slides up, uh, the first slide? Uh, and, and it has blessed our nation. So immigration, <laughs> there we go. Um, immigration, as we have uh, been talking about, I think this is, is this not on? Okay, uh, immigration, as we've been talking about, is definitely changing the face of American Christianity. But as I mentioned yesterday, that change is not just based upon net immigration, because the net immigration has slowed considerably, but it is really about changing the nation through birth rates. Now, what has happened because of immigration is what Stephen Warner points out. Now, first, when all these immigrants started coming into the United States, people were saying, what's going to happen to Christianity in America? Well, one hypothesis was made by Diana Eck. He's, she's a Harvard University professor. She's a Buddhist scholar. And she said, the more immigrants come from other places in the world, the less Christian America is going to be because they're bringing Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam. And people believe that for the longest time. In fact, she was given a million dollar grant to study this phenomenon. I have no idea what she did with the million dollars, but it really wasn't research, because her findings have turned out to be completely wrong. So give me a million dollars, I'll make up stuff too. So this research turned out to be just completely wrong, because what she was looking at was this concern that when we get people from Asia, for example, there's gonna be a lot more Buddhists in our neighborhood. Now, it is true that 30 years ago, you, have a Buddhist you didn't have a Buddhist temple, and now in your neighborhood, you do have a Buddhist temple. But what you ignore is not just the one Buddhist temple, but the 30 Korean churches that started alongside that Buddhist temple, and the 20 Chinese churches, and the five uh, Laotian churches, and five Cambodian churches. And what you focus on is, oh no, we've got a Buddhist temple in our neighborhood. We're terrified of the Buddhists in our neighborhood. Uh, you know, that's kind of bizarre to say we're terrified of Buddhists. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, and what are we going to do? And you're ignoring the 30, 40 churches. And it turns out that Christianity is not in decline in America because of immigration, according, uh, that, which is what Diana Eck was hypothesizing. Christianity in America is flourishing because of immigration and the Christian faith that immigrants bring. And so when we look at these numbers, we can say, oh no, America is gonna become less Christian. Actually, no, what we're seeing, is, Stephen Warner points out, the new immigrants represent not the de-Christianization of American society, that was what people were afraid of, the de-Christianization of American society, but get this, it is the de-Europeanization of American Christianity. This is the new reality that we're facing. This is an exciting moment in American history. Because what we're seeing is, the more diverse your institutions are, the more likely you're going to be growing and the more likely you survive into the next generation. So here are some denominations that are growing. The largest and the fastest growing denominations are Baptist and Pentecostal. Now what's happening here is you get all the Baptists in one room. Massive confusion when you try to get all these Baptists in one big room. But if you got all the Baptists together, you would have an extraordinarily diverse group. If you got all the Pentecostals in America together, you would have an extraordinarily diverse group. But when you look at the Lutherans, the UCC, the Episcopalians, they tend to be overwhelmingly white. Lutherans are 96% white. I'm still looking for that 4% non-white Lutherans. I haven't met any of them yet, but apparently they're out there. But you have these denominations that are overwhelmingly white, and those denominations tend to be shrinking and declining very significantly. So what we're seeing is, the more diverse you are as a church, as a denomination, as a Christian college, 
the more likely you're going to survive into the next generation. And that's what's so exciting about what's happening in the church right now, because what we're seeing is the greater the diversity, the more the move of God is becoming evident. So again, we don't run away and hide from these changes. We embrace them. We say thanks be to God for the diversity he's bringing because the kingdom of God is growing, is advancing because of this diversity that God has brought to the, uh, to the United States. Now, there's a second option, though, that we talked a little bit about yesterday. But the second option is not to run away and hide, but to give in. Not to give up, but to give in. And in this scenario, what you're doing is saying, we lost, so we give in to them. If you can't beat them, join them, right? So that's the temptation for the exile. Give up or give in. And Jeremiah 29, verse 8 through 9 says, you actually don't have the option of giving in. You don't do what the world does. You don't adapt the methodology of the world just because they beat you, just because you think they're better. You don't adapt the methodology of the world. You stay true to your identities as followers, followers of Jesus, followers of Yahweh. Verse 8. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. So these are false prophets who are following the practice of divination. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. So the Babylonians had some very interesting magic practices. And the Israel, the people of God, the exiles, were very tempted to follow these magic practices. Now, one of the things about the Babylonian divination practice that's listed up there, the practice of divination involved an incantation type of worship. So the incantation type of worship is you have a magic formula you follow, and at the end of that formula, you get exactly what you want. So that's the way idolatry works, by the way. That's why the nation of Israel was always tempted by idolatry, because it follows a simple formula. So uh, think of idolatry like a vending machine. So you go to a vending machine at your school or at work, and you put in $5 to get that Diet Coke, right? You put in your money, and you punch in J2, and you're supposed to get Diet Coke. Now, if you don't get Diet Coke and you get Mountain Dew, you're pretty upset. And there's a 1-800 number you can call to, to voice your discontent that you asked for Diet Coke and you got Mountain Dew instead. Because vending machines operate within a certain set of rules and what you ask for is what you're supposed to get. And that's the way idolatry worked in the ancient Near East. What you ask for is what you're supposed to get. You want a male child. You go to the temple and they tell you do the following formula things and you will get your male child. You want good crops that year. The idol worship at the temple of the idol and the, temple, uh, the idol uh, priest or priestess will say, do the following three things. Follow the formula and you will get good crops this year. Which makes kind of logical sense, but that's not the way Yahweh worship works. It's not what worshiping Jesus doesn't work that way. We don't worship Yahweh because he gives us what we want and gives us exactly the product we asked for, we worship God because of who he is. And so the temptation here is to trust more in the magic formulas than to trust in God. To trust in our own abilities to concoct the right set of circumstances to get what we want, rather than following the will and, 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 the, will and the values and the vision of our, of our savior. And so what we're seeing here in Jeremiah 29, verse 8 through 9, is you are not to follow the practices of the world around you. But here's what happened when things began to change. We did follow the practices of the world around you. We either gave up or we gave in. And one of the ways we gave in is something called the homogenous unit principle, which is based not upon scripture, but it's based upon a social cultural expectation. This uh, phrase, homophily, is a Greek, uh, comes from a Greek proverb that says, birds of a feather flock together. Ignore the kind of the sociological speak there with me, but what it really means is that people who are similar to each other, racially, culturally, socioeconomically, we just tend to hang out together, right? Birds of a feather flock together. Now, that's a great magic formula to sell Diet Coke. That's a great magic formula to sell hamburgers at McDonald's or McRib at McDonald's, depending on your demographic. So what you're dealing with is the world has figured out a way to segregate us in marketing and to be able to sell more products to you through the process of market segmentation or market segregation. 
So it actually does work because they do sell more products. McRib sells better in, the, in Chicago and in the South than it does in the East Coast. That's market segmentation. And so we took that secular cultural concept and applied it to the church and said, birds of a feather flock together. So we're going to get people that are like us to go to church with. So if I'm a white middle-class male, I'm not, but if I were a white middle-class male, I want to go to church with other white middle-class males. And if I'm a Korean American young person, I probably want to go to church with another Korean American young person. And so we developed this secular model of market segmentation. Now the product is, we're going to grow the church. And that's what happened. Churches did grow. But it, it completely undermined the theological, biblical value of unity in Christ. It undermined the value of Revelation chapter 7. It undermined the value of Micah chapter 4. It undermined the value of Acts chapter 2. And so what we did was we gave in to the secular concepts of unity or segregation by unity, and then we ignored the biblical values of this. And what has that led to? It has led to extreme segregation. Not minor segregation, but extreme segregation. This is the breaches. These are the breaches that we have to look out for. The very basic sociological definition of an integrated church or integrated community is if you have 80% of one group and 20% of another group, you are officially considered by sociological standards to be an integrated community. Feels kind of wimpy to me. And that's just kind of a, it feels like that's kind of, e that's a low bar to set. That seems pretty easy to pull off. 80% of one group, but 20% of another group. But that's the official sociological definition of diversity. But even given those numbers, what we find in American society is that given even those simple numbers, we still have extreme levels of segregation. So here's uh, the work of Michael Emerson, my provost at North Park University. He t uh, points out two different studies. The first study is looking at diversity in the local public schools, elementary, junior, high and high school, and comparing it to diversity in the local church. So in the uh, public school, the diversity index is 0.48. Uh, never mind how those numbers come out. I mean, I can give you those statistics later. But essentially, that, that's a pretty decent number. It's not a great number, but it's a decent number. It essentially says that 48% integration occurs in the school. The diversity in the churches, however, is 0.08%, which means schools are six times more diverse than the church. So this goes against the idea that your church is not diverse because your neighborhood is not diverse. Actually, according to the makeup of your local school, your school and your neighborhood is extraordinarily diverse. Your church is not diverse, but your schools are. So it shows again that even though society has actually become diverse, our local churches have not because we followed these homogenous unit principles from several decades ago. One more statistic. Uh, the dissimilarity index, which shows, um, the, in, in this case, the higher the number, the worse off you are. It shows the level of segregation in cities and in congregations. So the higher the number, the more extreme the segregation. Michael Emerson took the 10 most segregated cities in the United States. Uh, anybody know what was number one? It actually surprised me. What was number one? Cleveland was actually, I think it was in the top 10, but it was not number one. What, what do you think are some of the most segregated cities in the U.S.? Chicago, uh, Portland didn't make it because there's just not enough black people to have segregation in Portland. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's just, you gotta have a critical mass there and it's just not there in Portland right now. Sorry, no, I mean, that's actually true. <laughs> there's, uh, so what, what are the other places where there's segregation? Yeah, Baltimore is actually, in, I think not in the top 10, but it's, it's one of the more segregated. A lot of them are East Coast cities, yeah. Atlanta was not, actually. Atlanta's fairly well integrated, yeah. Uh, Los Angeles is actually fairly well integrated. Oakland is, uh, well, Oakland, if you compare it to San Francisco, yeah, that's, that's segregated. They got all the black folks to move to Oakland, all the rich white folks moved to San Francisco. So yeah, that's, that's segregated. But Oakland itself is actually, uh, is a little bit different, yeah. Birmingham was in the top 10. Yeah, there were only about two or three states that were in the top, t uh, cities that were in the top 10. Um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin was the most segregated city in the United States. 
And then following that was like Chicago, Detroit, a lot of Midwestern Rust Belt cities, and then one or two in the South and one or two in the East Coast. I believe Newark was another one, another one of those East Coast cities. Now, a side note, the, the level of segregation in Milwaukee allowed for some extreme injustice to occur in Milwaukee. So Milwaukee is hyper-segregated. You can really plot out where the African-Americans live, where the whites live. It's really simple to plot out the segregation in Milwaukee. But what happens in Milwaukee is that several years ago, the governor of Wisconsin decided to cut the transportation budget. Now, he was lauded for being fiscally responsible. He was lauded for being this great governor who cut the budget. But it turns out that he cut the transportation budget in such a way that the white neighborhoods still have public transportation, but because of hypersegregation, the black neighborhoods were cut off from public transportation. So it turns out that if you have hypersegregation, you're more likely to have racial injustice and economic injustice. So you can cut the budget across the board, but at the end of it, where the transportation goes into the black neighborhood, those are the first places cut, and the line still ran into the white neighborhoods. So segregation oftentimes does not yield results of equality and justice. And so what we're seeing, though, is in the church, the level of segregation, let's put that statistic back up, the most segregated cities in the U.S. have a segregation index of 0.6. Uh, means, it essentially means 60% of that city has to have some kind of disruption in order for there to be integration. That's a very high number. More than half your population needs to have disruption in order for there to be integration. That's a very high number. But look at the number for conservative Protestants slash evangelical churches. The number index is 0.91, meaning 91% of our churches have to have some kind of disruption in order for there to be integration. And we are 30, almost 30 percentage points higher than the most segregated cities in the United States. Michael Emerson goes on to point that only one other time in US history have we attained that level of hyper-segregation, that 0.91 number. Deep South Jim Crow laws. Is the only other time that this American society has seen segregation to that extreme, and the evangelical conservative Protestant church is competing with Deep South Jim Crow laws. So it took laws to create hypersegregation, and the church has done it all by itself. Now, this number, by the way, is not just on the macro level of kind of church movement, but in the latest polls, it showed that those uh, white evangelicals who uh, ended up uh, in, in, in terms of their relationships, it turned out that 91% of white evangelicals have no significant relationship with someone outside of their race. So it's not just a church matter, it's an individual matter when 91% of self-identified evangelicals do not have a significant friendship with someone of a different race. So we're talking about this hyper-segregation that bought into what the world was telling us to do. So we reject these options. We say we're not going to run away and hide, and we're not going to give up by doing what the world does. And I ask you again, uh, from, from yesterday, what then is our third option here? And our third option here, as I said, is the practice of lament to recover the lost discipline of lament. And I want to point out two things here in the book of Lamentations. The first is who wrote the book of Lamentations, and it's very important. This is an important part of understanding Lamentations. Who wrote the book of Lamentations? I mentioned yesterday that all the intellectuals, all the prophets, the priests, those who could read or write, those who had potential to rebuild that society, they were sent away into exile into Babylon. But Jeremiah was actually allowed to stay behind. If you read through the book of Jeremiah, you'll discover that Jeremiah actually says, you know what, give in to Babylon. This is God's righteous judgment. Babylonians knew about this, and they said, Jeremiah must be on our side. So we'll let him stay behind. So Jeremiah would be one of the very few, if not the only candidate, who actually could read or write and pull together a book like the book of Lamentations. And if you look at the structure and the writing of Lamentations, it actually takes some writing skills. It's not just some random person who threw it together. Someone who knew how to read or write put this book together. So Jeremiah might be, if not the only, one of the very few candidates who could write the book of Lamentations. However, the argument against Jeremiah authorship is that if you read the book of Jeremiah and read the book of Lamentations, it reads like two totally different books. 
The example that I use is, it's like Shakespeare and Tupac. Now, they're both great poets. They just have slightly different writing styles. I think you would agree with me, right? So it's like Shakespeare is a great poet. Tupac's a great poet. They just don't write the same way. So you're getting Jer... Tupac is too old of a reference, isn't it? Chance the Rapper? Chance the Rapper? Okay, better, better, better. <laughs> so you got Shakespeare and Chance the Rapper, both great poets. They just have slightly different writing styles. So you end up looking at Jeremiah, comparing it to Lamentations, and saying, how can the same guy write this? Well, here's the answer. It turns out that Jeremiah is the writer or editor or the curator of the information, but it's not his voice. It's one of the most beautiful things about the book of Lamentations. Jeremiah is the privileged, educated prophet. And instead of bringing his voice front and center, he goes to the city gate, which is the town hall, and he listens as the women, the children, the sick, the lame, the blind, they all come out and they start telling their stories. So Jeremiah is the privileged individual, but he doesn't tap into that privilege. He instead pushes aside his privilege and says, they don't need to hear my voice, the voice of the privilege. They need to hear the voice of the suffering and those that are hurting and those are the voices that he raises up. I argue in my book that Lamentations might be the most feminine book of the Bible because it's not Jeremiah's voice that comes out front and center, the privileged male voice. It is actually the voice of the women. It is the voice of the widows that speak out because Jeremiah recognizes, you've heard enough of the privileged voices. What you really need to hear are the voices of the suffering and those are the voices he call, uh, recollects in the book of Lamentations. And I want to point this out as those of us who are committed to racial reconciliation, we need to raise up the voice of the suffering, the marginalized, and the hurting. We don't need to keep elevating the voice of the privilege. Because what that does is it perpetuates the myth that only the privileged have something of value to say. That only the privileged have something of worth to say when actually we've got to hear the most marginalized of voices. Because in this dialogue on race, on reconciliation, on healing our communities, on repairing the breach, we've got to hear from those that have been marginalized. I'll give you an example of this. A negative example of this comes from, uh, this is the work of my mentor, uh, Willie Jennings, at, formerly at Duke, he's now at Yale University. And he asked the question, it's a little bit faded there, Whose gaze determines how society looks at another person? Whose perspective? Whose perspective and gaze is privileged in such a way that that person's point of view is the point of view that is accepted by the world? You understand what I'm saying? So the question is, whose gaze or whose point of view is the authoritative view on everybody else? So he breaks it down and he says, when the white male looks at the black male, the gaze of the white male upon the black male, what is the perception of the black male? He identifies it as the pet and the threat. So the pet would be the African-American male who is the entertainer, who is the singer, who is the rapper, who is the uh, athlete. And so uh, the comedian, the television star, these are the pets. Now what happens is they need to stay in that category of being a pet. Um, again, you, you all are too young for this. You all remember Chappelle? Yeah. Dave Chappelle? Okay, all right. Dave Chappelle, great show on Comedy Central. What did he do? He walked away from like $20 million on the table. Why? You're making me into your pet. Essentially, that's what he was saying. You're making me into your pet. Chappelle notes that every strong black male comedian in Hollywood ends up in drag at one point in their careers. You look at Eddie Murphy, phenomenal actor, they put him in drag at one, two, twice in his career. Jamie Foxx, they put him in drag. Martin Lawrence, Chappelle says, Martin Lawrence is one of the toughest guys in the world. They put him in drag because they are amplifying this image of the black male as a pet. In fact, when the black male steps out of being the pet, then you really are a threat. So even if a football player takes a knee during the national anthem, wait a minute, you're supposed to be the pet. You're not sounding like a threat. Or when a Christian hip hop artist stops talking about propitiation in his raps, but starts talking about race, you're no longer the pet. You are now a threat. And so there is this gaze of who gets to determine how a person is viewed by society. In fact, in terms of the threat, 
the most dangerous human being, according to the six o'clock news, is the unidentified black male. Because according to the six o'clock news, the local news, the unidentified black male has committed every single crime. The unidentified black male was involved in a drive-by shooting. The unidentified black male uh, 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 did an armed robbery at a liquor store. The unidentified black male was seen carrying a knife in your neighborhood. This unidentified black male is approximately 15 to 45 years old. He weighs anywhere from 150 to 350 pounds and maybe from five foot seven to six foot eight inches tall. If you have seen such a black male, please contact the authorities immediately. He is a threat to your neighborhood. And that's why a 17 year old kid in a hoodie with iced tea and Skittles in his pocket is automatically a threat. Because we have accepted the gaze of the dominant culture and said, that's the right perspective. That's why I have a 12 year old kid jumping around in a park in a second is shot and gunned down because even a 12 year old kid is seen as a threat as long as he's the unidentified black male. So are we going to accept the gaze of the dominant culture or are we going to say, of course, there is dignity in all human lives, but we have to assert that black lives matter because the world doesn't understand that. Now, one other piece of this. When the black male looks at the white female, what happens to the black male? In fact, the black male doesn't even have to look at the white female. But if the white female says, the black male looked at me, Emmett Till was killed because the white female said, that boy looked at me wrong. She has admitted, actually, very recently, that she made the whole thing up. But what happened to that black male who looked at or was accused of looking at the white female? He was killed. He was lynched. He was impaled. And so that threat of the black male, especially as a sexual threat against the white male, and the white male must do everything to protect that white female. And that's why it was not an accident when a presidential candidate opens the very first words and phrases out of his mouth at the opening of his campaign is what? Mexicans are rapists. That was not an accident. That was an intentional statement to say, and by the way, all people are racist and all people are rapists. All right, there's no kind of proof that shows one people group rapes more than another people group. But he points that out to say Mexicans are rapists because it perpetuates the dialogue. That means we've got to do everything to protect our women from these violent Mexicans, these violent black men, these violent Muslim men. We have got to do everything to protect our white women and it doesn't matter what that cost is. That's what we're going to do. So again, I ask the question, whose gaze are you going to believe in? Whose point of view, whose perspective? When the Lord looked at creation and said, it is good, do you think he just said only white bodies are good? Or did he say all of humanity and creation is good? So when the dominant culture gay says, the gays say that, hey, black men are, not, are worth less than we as the body of Christ say, that is not the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord stands in opposition to that. So we figure out ways where we hear the stories of those that are different from us. We figure out ways that we learn the lessons that we need to learn. And we figure out ways where the world's narrative is not the narrative we embrace, but we embrace the way God views us and God views each other. Now, I want to talk about the second aspect of Lamentations that I hope will speak to us. And that is that Lamentations is in the format of something called the funeral dirge. Um, the funeral dirge is uh, found in chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 4. The lament genre is huge. There's several different types of lament. Individual lament, corporate lament, uh, city lament. There's all these different types of lament. One of the subgenres of the larger genre of lament is something called the funeral dirge. 
And chapter one, chapter two, and chapter four of Lamentations follows the characteristics of the funeral dirge. It begins with the word aka, which is translated as how or how can this be, and that's reflective of a funeral dirge usage. It also uses something called the kina meter. Any Scrabble players, that's a great word. Q doesn't use the U, you know, triple word score, you got a good word for you. Kina meter, which essentially translated means the limping meter. Now, if you look at the Psalms and you look at the Old Testament poetry, Hebrew poetry, one of the characteristics of Hebrew poetry is something called a balanced metering. So if you have one line that's six beats or six meters, then the next line is going to have six beats. So it's like you're kind of walking one beat, one beat, one beat. So there's a balance to that meter. Six beats, six beats, five beats, five beats. And that's your standard Hebrew poetry. Every once in a while, you'll see something called the kina meter or the limping meter. So instead of six beats followed by six beats, you get six beats followed by four beats. Five beats followed by three beats. Eight beats followed by four beats. What it does in that kind of uneven rhythm, it creates a dissonance. So if there is poetry that is even and metered, then that creates a smoothness of reading. But when you get to a kina meter, you say, whoa, what's going on here? Because there is an uneven metering. There's an imbalance to the metering. And that shows up quite often in Lamentations 1, 2, and 4, chapters 1, 2, and 4. Now, there's a whole bunch of other characteristics as well. There's about eight to nine, maybe even 10 characteristics that identify chapter 1, 2, and 4 as a funeral dirge. Why is this important? A funeral dirge or a lament at a funeral is different from your typical lament. The way I describe it is that if you're a pastor or your friend <coughs> and you visit someone in the hospital, you offer a lament. Because when you're visiting someone in a hospital, that person might be sick, but that person might get better, right? Because the person is still alive. So you go, you hold hands, and you anoint with oil, and you sing some songs, and you, you hug, and you, and you do all these wonderful things because you believe that that person in the hospital could get better. Person's not dead. Person's still alive. And you believe the hope of that person still being alive. So a lament that you offer at a hospital is different from a funeral dirge. And if you're a pastor, you better not act the same way in a hospital that you would at a funeral because it's a totally different scenario. In a hospital, the body's still alive, still hope for healing. In a funeral, the body is dead. There is a dead body in the room. The problem with our racial reconciliation efforts is that some of us believe that racial reconciliation is a hospital visit. But racial reconciliation is a funeral dirge. Because a hospital visit, you join hands, you sing kumbaya, you say I love you man, and you hug it out, and all things are better. But in a funeral, there is a dead body in the room, and you better deal with a dead body in the room. And historically, those dead bodies have been the bodies of black men and black women. So we can't go into the conversation on race and say, all we got to do is join hands and sing Kumbaya. Because we're at a funeral. And you've got to know the history, the long list of dead body after dead body after dead body. My studies in African American church history has, has really challenged me on what it means to understand the dead bodies that are in the room. The story goes back to the beginning of the slave trade where Africans were kidnapped from the inland of Africa and brought to the coast of Africa. One of the first things that were done by the slave traders was to strip the Africans of their any expressions of their identity. They separated husbands and wives, parents and children. They took away jewelry and, 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 and clothing that represented their tribal affiliation. So by stripping them naked and by separating them from their family, they reduced them away from their human dignified identity to just becoming chattel labor, slave, slave labor. And so they would march them naked from the inland coast, inland Africa to the coast of Africa. And they would take them to the slave castles on the west coast of Africa. Some of you have seen the images or know about these slave castles. They were deliberately built, especially on the inside of these castles, to look like tombs. And they would bring the African bodies into these tombs to kill them of their African identity. 
separated from parents, separated from spouses, separated from children, stripped of their identity. They were literally put into tombs to kill their identity and dignity as one who made in the image of God. They would march out these future slaves. They would bring them out to the dock. There's a, one of the key people in the initiation of the slave trade was Prince Henry of Portugal. He had a secretary who was essentially his historian. His name was Zurara. Zurara writes down the account of what he sees of the very early stages of the slave trade. And as the bodies are trotted out and about to be taken into possession to be sold into slave labor, Zurara sees this and he says, this isn't right. People shouldn't be treated this way. In fact, it says that Zurara's tears, he's weeping because he sees this inhumanity and he weeps tears and his tears wet the pages of his notes because it's, it's such an indignity. This is not the way God had intended human beings to be tra- treated. His tears wet the pages of his diary. But he says two things. He says, first of all, my leader is Prince Henry. And if my leader says it's okay and he's a good Christian man, then as as horrible as this, I think this is, I'm gonna trust my leader and believe that this is okay. So he submits to the leadership of this good Christian man. Now what he also does, the second thing Zorara notes, is that uh, as indication of his good Christianity is that he takes a tenth of the slaves he's about to take into possession and he gives them as a tithe to the priests that are with him. So that from the very beginning of the slave trade, the church was culpable because we received human beings as a tithe and accepted that and gave a blessing to the beginning of that slave trade. The slaves are put into the hull of the ship. You've seen some of the images. They're not placed like human beings on a cruise ship. They're placed side by side as if they were dead. Again, mimicking being in the grave because we're trying to kill their identity as husbands and as wives and as parents and as children, kill that identity so that they can become nothing, nothing, nothing more than chattel slave labor. They're put into these hulls side by side as if in a tomb. Many of them would stage hunger strikes. There's evidence of the tools that were used by the slave traders. They were iron uh, jaws that would force the mouth open and they would force feed these prisoners, these uh, kidnapped individuals with food so their cargo could make it to the new world. Many would die and they would throw the bodies overboard and if they were ever given a chance to go up to the top of the ship, they would make a beeline for the, for the, for the ocean and dive into the oceans. It is documented that slave ships would always have a school of sharks following them because they knew that a body would be coming over at any time and they could devour. Whether it was live or dead, they would eat that dead body. The sharks knew. The slave ship would come into the new world pull up to the the docks of New England, the docks of the Mid-Atlantic, the places where the slave trade of the transatlantic slave trade would, would culminate. And when they would pull up, they would ring the auction bell to let everybody know that the slave ship has arrived and it was now time to take these captives as slaves and take them home. And when they arrived on a Sunday, the church bells would ring. Frederick Douglass notes that the church bells would ring in tandem with the auction bell. And the very people who sang, praise God, from whom all blessings flow, who sang the beautiful songs of church bells ringing, would come right down the hill to the dock and hear the auction bell and take home a prisoner, take home a slave with them. The slave bell would ring in tandem with the auction bell. They would take these prisoners, they would take these kidnapped people, and, and, and now they are fully, newly identified after they've been put into the tombs, put into the ships, now they are fully re-emerging out of those ships as simply no more than slave labor, than chattel slaves. They're brought to the plantation. Now, they've lost everything, but they say, we gotta rebuild our society. We've gotta rebuild our, and the best way to rebuild the society and restore dignity is family. So despite all the protestations and all the, the obstacles, the African slaves, would find each other 
and find a way to get married. Now, of course, the landowner, the slave owner didn't want that, so they held secret ceremonies, one of which is the jumping of the broom, the jumping the broom. And to this day, that practice is still practiced in many of the African-American communities. It was, what was the only thing that was allowed that would allow them to say, we are now uh, married to one another. But the slave owner, of course, would hear about this. He would learn that a couple of his slaves had gotten married, and he's got to reassert his authority over the plantation. If you have children and if you have families and you have marriage and a society, the family's going to be rebuilt. The slave owner couldn't have that. So he created on the plantation a systematic system of rape and sexual abuse to deliberately rape the wife so that the husband would lose his dignity and pride to deliberately rape the wife and the black women so that they knew who's the boss and that it was the white slave owner. There was a systematic action to rape and sexually abuse black women over and over and over again and to reduce the dignity of black men over and over and over again. They did everything to destroy the black family. And that's why now when I hear media and political pundits say, what's wrong with a black family? Why can't black folks get it together? There's something wrong with a black family. There's nothing wrong with the black family. The black family's a miracle. It is a gift of God. The fact that society for 500 years has done everything in its power to destroy the black family, and yet the black family survives and thrives in our society, that's a miracle. That's a gift of God. We need to hear these stories. We need to know that we're not at a hospital visit, but we're walking into a funeral. And the dead bodies that are in our story must be acknowledged. The dead bodies of four little girls in a Birmingham church. The dead bodies of strange fruit hanging from southern trees. The dead bodies of Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, Oscar Grant. The list goes on and on and on. Our history is littered and filled with dead bodies. And if we think we're going to sing a couple of songs of Kumbaya and that's all done with, we are fooling ourselves. Lament calls us into the engagement of truth that our history is littered with dead bodies and we've got to deal with those dead bodies. My challenge to you as a scored community and where you go from here is to recognize that there are no easy answers to the challenge of racial justice and racial reconciliation. There are no easy answers. We will stand and continue to stand for justice for the very least of these because we don't care what the government says about it. This is what the Bible tells us to do. We will do what the Bible tells us to do. We will stand for the least of these. And it will be a long struggle, but we would do it because it is what the scripture calls us to do, to stand for the very least of our brothers and our sisters. We would speak truth to one another because without truth, we're just treading water. But with truth, the truth that comes from lament, the truth telling that is so desperately needed, we will now begin to move forward because truth has to be told if reconciliation is going to occur. And we will stay on our knees and pray because this is not just a battle against flesh and blood. It is against the powers and principalities of this world, this fallen and broken world that has tried everything to tear us apart, that has tried everything to hide stories, that has tried everything to destroy dignity. And this world has tried over and over again. And we will stay on our knees against the powers and principalities of this world. I'll leave you with this following story. Um, my mom is now in her 80s. Uh, she has early stages of dementia, Alzheimer's. Uh, she was a, a woman deeply committed to bringing hope and grace and mercy and justice and truth to her family. When my dad walked out on my family when I was about 10 years old, my mom did everything to keep our family together. She went and got two jobs. She worked from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. at an inner city carryout in Baltimore. 
the kind with the bulletproof glass and the lazy Susan passing the food and money back and forth. And she would spend close to 12 hours working at that inner city carryout. And after she was done there, she would go to her night shift at an inner city nursing home where she would change the bedpans and be on call from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. And then she would rush home, wake up the kids, feed us breakfast, send us on our way. She would sleep for two to three hours and then go back to work. She worked 20 hours a day, six days a week, so that she could keep her family together. And then on the seventh day, she would go to church, bring the kids to church, and she would work in the kitchen at the church, making food for the elders and deacons at the church. She set an example for my sisters and I of what it means to be committed to the work of Jesus Christ, what it means to be a follower of Jesus despite the most difficult of circumstances. She's in her 80s, but when she was in her 60s, she showed me the condition of her knees. Most of us have one kneecap on each knee. My mom has five kneecaps on each knee. Because when she kneels, as she has knelt in prayer every day for the last 50 years, an hour or two a day, on a hardwood floor, your kneecaps can't take that kind of pressure. So now at the age of 80, when she prays, her kneecaps spread open to conform to the shape of the floor. <laughs> And when she prays, her body knows because her kneecaps spread to fold to the shape of the wooden floor. These are the hidden stories that we need to hear. These are the stories of pain of an immigrant family. She was not a welfare queen as identified by the government in the 1990s. She's not a castaway immigrant because her language skills are not as good as others. She is not someone who's to be cast aside because she's a single mom. Hers are the stories that we as God's people need to lift up and hear. To hear the stories of the brokenness of these communities and the pain in these communities, but also the joy and the triumph of these communities. This is not an easy task you have chosen. This is not an easy task you have said yes to. But if we are to heed the call of God to be reconcilers, restorers of the breach, then persevere on your knees in faithfulness to what God has called you. God bless you. May you continue to bless the work you're called to. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.